Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, we have a great panel of alumni and faculty members that are here tonight, and we're going to be discussing um, which degree is right for you. Is it the DNP or the PhD? So I'm excited to hear their insight and expertise that they have to share about their own experience um, getting these degrees and where they have gone after they have graduated from NYU Myers. So this uh, should program is hosted by the Alumni Association at NYU Myers. We represent about 16,000 alumni all around the world, and we have about 20 events a year. And right now, because of the global pandemic, we've moved all of our programming online. So it's been very exciting to have people from all over the country joining us for these programs. So if you are someone from the West Coast, we especially welcome you tonight that you're able to join us this evening. Um, so this morning we sent out the confirmation and it had it held a, a, an attachment to it that kind of laid out the differences between the DNP and the PhD programs. Hopefully you had a chance to look at that. If you did not receive that for some reason, I will be sending that in our follow-up survey after the event tonight. So um, you'll be able to see that. But that document was really a great framework for some of the things we'll be discussing tonight um, and laid out really some of the differences and similarities in these, in these degrees. And tonight what we're going to do is really hear firsthand what it's like to go through the process of getting these degrees. So I want to go on ahead and introduce our panelists tonight. Uh, we have um, Dr. Melissa Ogimini, and she graduated from NYU Myers PhD program in 2018 and has 15 years of clinical bedside nursing experience in the United States and internationally. Dr. Ogimini has held adjunct faculty appointments at both Seattle Pacific University and Bellevue College teaching undergraduate nursing students in clinical, classroom, and simulation lab settings. She is currently a program manager with Partners in Health Health, and her research interests lie in health services, research, and leadership capacity building. Dr. Jin Jun has graduated from the NYU Myers PhD program in 2018. Since graduating, Dr. Jun completed a National Clinician Scholars Postdoc Fellowship at the University of Michigan and currently is an assistant professor at the Ohio State University College of Nursing. Dr. Jun's research focuses on addressing healthcare professionals' well being at the individual and systems levels. A triple alumna of NYU Myers and graduated from the DNP program in 2018. She's a clinical assistant professor in the psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner program at NYU, adjunct faculty in the integrative trauma studies program at the National Institute for the Psychotherapies, and has a part time private practice. She is currently a candidate in the first ever DNP in NYU's postdoc program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. She is an active member of the American Psychiatric Nurses Association, the International Society for Psychiatric Nursing, the American Nurses Association, and is the co-chair of the Psychiatric Mental Health Special Interest Group of the National Organization of Nurse Practitioner Faculties. And finally, jo Dr. Joan Miravite graduated from the DNP program in 2019. She is a practicing family nurse practi practitioner with over 19 years of clinical experience working in neurology. Her expertise focuses on the evaluation and programming of deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and dystonia. Dr. Miravite's clinical expertise, the DBS programmer, has allowed her to improve the quality of life of patients with disabling and advanced movement disorders. She is currently an adjunct professor at NYU Myers, an assistant professor of neurology for Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and a clinical instructor for Columbia University School of Nursing. Thank you ladies so much for being with us tonight. So in addition to our alumni, I also mentioned that some of our faculty are here. So we are fortunate to have our program directors for our DMP and PhD programs here with us this evening, and I'm going to let them actually introduce themselves. Um, Dr. Vetter, would you like to go first? Sure. My name is Mary Jo Vetter, and I am an adult geriatric primary care nurse practitioner and the director of the DNP program. And I'm so excited that we have so many of our alumni in attendance this evening. Welcome. And Dr. Squires? Hi everyone, uh, delighted to have you all in attendance. I'm Allison Squires. I am the PhD program director uh, and when I'm not doing that, I am a health services researcher with a, uh, who has worked both domestically and internationally. And uh, my work domestically largely focuses on addressing immigrant health disparities. Thank you both. 
So now I want to go ahead and turn our attention to our DNP and PhD alumna. And of course, if you have any questions during this session, please enter them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the uh, presentation, we will get to as many questions as we possibly can. So go ahead, don't be shy throughout the program, just be chatting us up um, in the Q&A box throughout the program. Okay, so I want to first start by asking all four of our alumna a question um, of how did you decide which degree to get? So tell us your decision making process and how did you decide that Myers was the best fit for you versus another institution? Do you want us to just jump in? Sure, go ahead, Jen, go right ahead. Okay, so I could start the discussion. I think this conversation of, of choosing which terminal degree has all, it's always been complicated process because it's not just about education or what you want to do, but it's also lifestyles, what you want to do going forward. For me, um, I do come from a very strong clinical background. I was a, a trauma nurse as well as a geriatrics nurse practitioner who's done international work in India and clinically over 15 years. However, in terms of choosing the terminal degree, really centered around where I wanted to go like long term. So I um, thought hard about DMP because, you know, clinical work is a big part of who we are as a profession. And, but for me, I think the determining factor was when I was practicing as a nurse practitioner in India. And during the time, I really just was frustrated by lack of voice for nurses, not just in the US, but around the world. And with my mentors, we've had many discussions on like, you know, what's the best way for me, how I thought I could add to the conversation internationally and also in the US. And in addition to that, I was really interested in policy development and creating knowledge to support uh, different policies. Because as you know, my research focuses on nursing workforce. And sometimes we are not at the table with the policy, policy decision making. So that really, to be honest, was the uh, determining factor. Like, how can I be sitting at the table with everybody else who's not a nurse, but really make our voices heard? Okay. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Danielle, would you like to go next? Sure, I'm happy to go next. So my interest in my doctoral degree began when I was doing my master's, so in my graduate program. I remember being, I was certainly excited about developing my new skill set as an APRN, specifically in psychiatry and mental health. However, I also felt a really strong desire to have a broader impact on the field. I felt really passionate about imparting my practice wisdom and expertise at the clinician level. So I then decided to pursue my DNP degree where um, I was able to learn strategies and techniques to translate the evidence base into my practice, specifically my area of interest being developing educational systems. So my DNP project specifically focused on developing a quality improvement project pertaining to graduate psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner education. Now, why NYU specifically? Again, thinking about my experience as a graduate student completing my master's, many of my mentors, um, well, I had developed many mentors during that time, and I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to then build upon that foundation and continue in my doctoral studies with the support of those mentors, with an understanding of how the NYU system worked and it turned out to be really valuable for me and my current professional life as it stands. Thank you. Um, Joan, would you like to go next? Yes. Um, so I really chose to um, go into get my DNP as a terminal degree because I wanted to really maintain my clinical practice, but really expand my role and as, as Jen said earlier, sit at the table, you know, at the multidisciplinary table and really have my voice as a nurse as part of the team. 
Um, and I agree also with Danielle that um, it's, it, it really helps my, my education has helped me to really understand how evidence-based practice can be um, evident. Yeah. That I can put evidence-based medicine into my own practice as a DNP as well. And it, it's really um, my, my experience at NYU was really amazing because um, my, my project was to create a video to educate caregivers of hospice patients, which was a very difficult project to, to, to do. But I, I reached out to multiple schools at NYU and I worked with the film school. I worked with, uh, and it was a really a, a beautiful experience. I really, I loved working on my project. So um, I, I think that um, I, I wanted to finish my DNP and um, be able to incorporate that into my current practice now. And also, um, Jen and Danielle spoke about mentorship. Um, I really had wonderful mentors at NYU that helped me through my DNP um, project. So, um, Sorry, I don't. I I can't. I um. I just lost my my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Right. Okay. Thank you, Joan. Okay. Um, Melissa, would you like to share with us? Hi, everyone. Um, I think the primary emphasis for me and my decision making was that I knew that I wanted to be at an institution um, where they were doing global health work. And I wanted nursing to be at the helm of that work and not necessarily being a supporting cast member um, within the interprofessional kind of space. Uh, secondly, um, when you think about nursing and when you think about global health, that already limits the number of options that are out there um, domestically within the US when you're looking at a PhD program specifically. And so from that, I think the real clincher for me was one night I was on NYU site and looking at faculty that could potentially serve as an advisor or a mentor. And that's actually when I came across Dr. Squire's profile because we had many similar interests that aligned. So from that late night kind of search, um, reached out to her and was able to connect and kind of learn a little bit more about the program and really what was going on at, um, at the school at the time. Um, and so for me, it was really trying to identify the faculty who could support my vision and kind of where I wanted to go, even though I may not have been necessarily particularly articulate as to what I wanted, but I knew that for me that NYU would be the place that would be the best fit for me in terms of being able to be cultivated, to be nurtured, um, and to get to that next level. Um, in terms of thinking about doctorate work and the PhD specifically, I know that the decision for that for me primarily was um, trifold. It was one, primarily, I wanted to be a change agent within the profession of nursing globally. And so I wanted to be able to be at that table to make decisions, just like um, uh, my other colleagues have spoken about today. And so it was really looking at how can I leverage myself or put myself in the best position to be able to be at that table, but also to be able to impact and make change at a higher level as well, too, which is really what went into me choosing a PhD rather than a, a DNP. Thank you, Melissa. So uh, we get a lot of questions from prospective students for these programs, wondering what it was really like to obtain your degree. Um, you know, they're juggling families, they're juggling full-time work. You know, they're wondering what what is it, what kind of workload really goes into a capstone or a dissertation and how do you choose um, how, to, how to handle this and, and how much time does it really take to put these projects together? Um, so if you could just speak a little bit about your process um, and what your experience was like um, logistically of like actually getting these degrees would be great. I could jump in on that one, um, if that's okay. Um, for me, it basically enabled, I had um, actually just moved across the world. So I, I was in Rwanda actually for a year, a small country in East Africa working there. So I literally um, made the decision to leave the, the position that I had there, come back to the States and then begin doctoral study. Um, so it involved me relocating. So relocating to New York City for the first time. 
Um, it involved me leaving full-time employment, uh, becoming a full-time student, uh, living on a stipend in one of the most expensive cities in the world. Um, I was not married at the time and I didn't have children. So I did not have that ob those obligations um, to kind of factor in and consider. Um, but in terms of from a financial standpoint, I was able to supplement income by working on my breaks um, clinically and working with other faculty members on some of their grants um, to supplement income. Um, it took me five years to finish my doctoral study um, full time uh, as a student. And um, in terms of workload, you know, it's, it's similar to, uh, if you can imagine if you're doing full time work right now um, for the doctoral program, the PhD program, uh, full-time study is, you know, pretty much the same, if not more. Um, you do have that flexibility to kind of outside of class arrange how you work, how best you work. Um, but the workload is demanding. Um, it's, uh, I want to say it's one of, it was one of the most challenging five years of my life, but also five years of my life that I have been probably um, the most supported and also, I think, gratifying in terms of that experience. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and kind of let some of my other colleagues uh, jump in, but um, that was in, in a lump sum, in a, in a, in a quick um, sum up kind of my experience. Go ahead, Danielle. Sure, I'm happy to jump in from the DNP perspective. And I suppose I'll begin at the beginning. So prior to applying for the DNP program at NYU, I was working as a psych NP in private practice while also um, working as an adjunct instructor in the psych NP program at NYU. So I applied for the DNP following my dreams to have this greater impact at the education level. And what drew me to NYU's program was the hybrid approach uh, that the curriculum took in that some of what some of the courses I took were offered in an online format and some were offered in person. And I found that that really worked well with my schedule being in practice and also having the flexibility of learning online as well as in person. For me, in-person learning is really special because it provides that human contact and connection that I, I mean, I personally feel uh, strongly about that role in education, but it really was a nice blend. So I think in the beginning, the initial focus was on collaborating with DNP faculty to figure out a clinical site. And once I found a clinical site for my DNP project, I then uh, collaborated with stakeholders in figuring out what type of problem, what type of improvement initiative we wanted to pursue in that site. And throughout the program past that point, uh, I was supported in examining the existing literature around my identified problem and then figuring out how to take that evidence base and then develop a program to address my problem in my clinical setting. So ultimately, my project, my population, my clinical site first rather, was the psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner program at NYU. And my identified problem with input from stakeholders was that we did not have a trauma-focused psychotherapy course within our program. And per national guidelines, it was recommended that we include trauma-focused psychotherapy. So I went to the literature and I discovered that the strongest evidence base for teaching trauma-focused psychotherapy was experiential training. So from that evidence base, I then developed a program where I was able to implement an experiential training module with graduate students that taught them trauma-focused psychotherapy. And my DNP mentors helped me to look at every aspect of that process, including uh, setting up the intervention, looking at process, and looking at outcomes. Um, it actually ended up being a really impactful project, and it has been disseminated to some degree at other universities across the country. So it was very useful to my career now. I'm a clinical assistant professor, so a full professor in the Psych NP program at NYU, and I feel I have a, a solid base on curriculum development and pulling in uh, evidence-based practice into my courses. 
Thanks, Danielle. That's really a great way to uh, take that capstone and, and push your career forward. Actually, that's really exciting. Uh, Jen or Joan, do you want to share your experience? Sure, I could jump in and uh, share my experience or like the logistics of getting a PhD. So Melissa and I were in the same cohort and we both finished in five years. So we started together, we ended together the program. And I will say that <clears throat> it did take a lot of planning in terms of just uh, logistical planning before starting the program from the financial perspective because I think many of the nurses, uh, including myself, when I went from BSN to MSN, there was an option of working full-time, going to school full-time, and trying to juggle everything. With PhD programs, NYU, uh, I believe we still do offer the part-time option, but for the most part, it is full-time in a lot of schools. And even as a part-time student, my colleagues have shared that the workload is not any part-time. So it is, it becomes your life for the, the, the during the that time. And I do think that that is one uh, deciding factor for many people as well to choose PhD versus DMP. Just like Melissa, I also worked as a per diem nurse during my entire five years of program. Um, so that kind of supplemented, but it was a funded program, our N NYU PhD program, meaning that up to when we were in the program it was up to two years that may have changed um, but for the first two years the tuitions and stipends were funded not to you know it's not any amount that you could make a comfortable living or anything like that but paid for food and things like that so in terms of just true logistics it did require a great d degree of intensity so i think but I think um, at least for me, I knew going in. So I planned it, you know, a couple months prior, like saved a lot of money. And I knew um, it was gonna be challenging in terms of maintaining <laughs> my lifestyle. So that there was a, a change in that. So it kind of worked around it, but it is, it's not um, our typical, the MSN, at least the way I got my nurse practitioner degree. Thanks, Jen. So I want to pose an, another question. I know that a lot of people uh, think about this as well as when they're considering um, another degree. Um, but you know, how is how has your career changed um, since from prior to getting this degree? Um, I, I think that all of you have cited that you were, you know working as nurses, and now some of you have moved on to completely different types of positions um, in nursing, whether it's academia or research. Um, so would love to hear some of those career opportunities that have now presented themselves because you have um, received this degree and, and how your career has changed as a result. So um, I... I've worked as an, an, a nurse practitioner, I'm a family nurse practitioner for uh, many years before I started the DNP and I have two little girls and a full-time job. So that part was difficult. Um, but I, I actually, the DNP program was actually workable because it is only class once a month and the rest of the work was um, working online or with my collaborating with the other students in my class. So um, my, my classmate and I worked on our doctoral project um, and she lives in Boston. So that was difficult, but we figured out um, how to use technology to work on our project together. But to answer this question, um, you, the, the DNP, after getting my DNP, um, I, I would, I've been able to work as an, I'm now an adjunct professor at NYU. I was able to join the faculty at Mount Sinai School of Medicine um, as an assistant professor of neurology um, with, with a doctorate degree. I am, I've been asked to work and um, educate multidisciplinary um, clinicians at, at the national level for the Parkinson Foundation. They have a training course. And so I'm the nurse, nurse practitioner representative for that multidisciplinary training course. Um, and so I, I really feel like 
getting my doctorate degree has opened up doors for me as far as education, which is what I always wanted to do. Um, that was why I wanted to go into get my DNP in the first place to really, you know, give back and, and really um, teach. Because um, I've precepted for many, many years and I really love that. I love working one on one with people and really explaining things to them. But I also love now being as an, um, an adjunct professor is it's really rewarding. Um, but um, I, I really feel that getting my doctorate degree has opened a lot of doors for me. Go ahead, Danielle. Sure. I really love Joan's description of the DNP opening up doors, because that's certainly what it's felt like. Um, aside from my clinical practice, I've been able to obviously broaden my impact in healthcare as far as an academic pers uh, perspective. But also with my DNP, I've been invited to join expert panels. Uh, most recently, I was on a panel that developed trauma, psychological trauma competencies for nursing education at the undergrad and graduate level. And I was also appointed co-chair of the NOMF Psychiatric Mental Health Special Interest Group. And what's really important about that is we're currently working on revisions or an updated version of the NOMF competencies. And those competencies define uh, population-specific curriculum content that should be included in graduate uh, nursing programs. So my DNP has helped me to gain these leadership positions and to be um, you know, key stakeholder in these really important decisions. So the other uh, big professional change for me was my acceptance to the NYU postdoctoral program in psychoanalysis. Now, as a postdoc program, it's historically been limited to just medical doctors and psychologists. And aside from Hildegard Peplau <laughs> from back in the 50s, I'm really the first nurse and specifically the first doctor of nursing practice to be accepted into this program. So I feel that my DNP has allowed me to pave the way and define nursing um, as we look forward essentially. <laughs> That's all I have. That's great. Uh, Melissa or Jen, do you want to share from a PhD perspective? Sure. Um, so for me, um, in terms of changes, I think the changes came with from the second, you know, from the moment that I chose the degree because um, I was not particularly a research interested student as uh, you know as a nurse or even as an undergrad or master's level so I think for me the changes were happening prior but the biggest change for me professionally has been more thinking globally so I don't mean like just physical global sense but kind of stepping outside of what we know in my own environment in the hospitals or clinics or wherever I was practicing at just kind of like being able to have a bird's eye view and having like, being engaged in conversations at that a little bit of a bigger sense. Like, um, so I think a lot of the other panelists mentioned interprofessional conversations that are taking place and not just sitting at the table with the other people, with the other professions per se, but then I also have an input to the decision making process. So I think from the research perspective, like clinically, um, my clinical practice has gone down as a tenure track research professor. But I, you know, the, in terms of research, I am doing a lot more interprofessional work at the uh, generating knowledge level. I don't know if that uh, answers any questions. I don't have a specific examples that I think of like right now other than during my fellowship that I it was um, true interprofessional so we were working on different projects together so even for a research project that involved nursing and actually um, postpartum patients it wasn't just the medical professionals that were doing it but it was true collaboration so those are some of the examples of the professional changes so I think for me I did have a huge um, 
change in terms of the direction that I was going then before the PhD. I think just to echo off of Jen really quickly, just, you know, three points. Um, I think one of the things that I've noticed for me post-graduation has been the uniqueness with the PhD degree in the sense that it stands, um, you know, it stands, it stands, what do I say? It stands alone. So having a PhD, you know, that's kind of transferable regardless of degree, regardless of discipline, um, a PhD kind of, it, it kind of sets that, that bar so that it, it uh, I guess it's, it's comparable in that sense to other disciplines when I'm serving on boards or I'm serving in other um, kind of organizational settings. I would say secondly to kind of echo what Jin has said, um, I still consider myself very much a novice researcher and similar to her, research was not necessarily my um, primary interest in going into the PhD, but with that said, what I think I've gained the most is transferable skills um, and primarily a baseline, baseline knowledge to critically examine and problem solve in a very unique way with attention to detail, which I can do both at a very macro big level, but also very micro um, level. And I think that that has really been heightened um, with this degree, uh, with my PhD. And I didn't necessarily have that, I guess, um, problem solving, critical thinking, decision making after I'd finished my master's degree. So that would be kind of what I, what I would say on that. Thanks, Melissa. Um, another question about uh, how your careers have changed. Again, all of you um, were in a clinical space beforehand. Um, are you still, you know, talk about your, where you are clinically now. Are you still working as a clinician? Um, how has that part of your practice changed? I, I, for me, the answer is really quick, so I will go first. So clinically, I no longer practice clinically, um, starting once again on the research tenure track. So that's my answer. However, that was uh, actually a soul searching decision as a nurse. I think letting that go was very difficult. Um, but, f and not all research track, tenure track professors have to drop that. Like that was my decision. But once again, I study nurses and nurses well being at the systems level. So I really am, um, that's where I wanted to place my focus. Um, I'll just follow up Jen really quickly. Um, so I still practice clinically after my graduation from my PhD program, um, but life happens. So after graduation, right before I got married, I just had a daughter last year. And so I haven't practiced for about a year and COVID hit. So that's really taken me kind of out of the clinical um, environment completely. And so as of right now, I'm not sure if I'll be returning clinically to practice. Um, but that's a kind of an evolving uh, bit. So while my clinical practice has decreased, I'm now working more at a program management administrative level with the work that I'm doing. Um, so still, you know, collaborating with Jen, still collaborating with Dr. Squires on projects and doing some research, but now I'm seeing more of the program management work is going up and kind of a bit more of the research work going up and clinically my um, clinical hours are just kind of um, been dwindling as a result. So I work full time as a nurse practitioner, um, but my my role is is a little bit different. Um, I've I've become a director of multidisciplinary care for movement disorders at Mount Sinai. So they've expanded my role, um, but I still do the same thing as what I've been doing all along. Um, it's just I have a nicer title. <laughs> just kidding. I um, no, they they really gave me a title because they recognized what I do at, uh, with my job. So I, I reach out, I work a lot with neurosurgeons and physical therapy and speech and psychiatry. Um, and so um, I still continue to do that. But, um, and then I'm, I'm teaching a lot more for the School of Medicine. Like I teach the medical students and residents and fellows as well as nurse practitioners. So um, uh, 
uh, it's, I'm super busy. I can share a little bit as well. Clinically, I have a part-time private practice as a nurse practitioner in psychiatry. The DNP in a really unexpected and wonderful way has even impacted my clinical practice, my work with patients specifically, because I really, I guess I really noticed this internal shift for myself, this perspective shift where I learned to appreciate the complexities of systems, not just as they exist in healthcare, but as they exist with people and with people's relationships to their own problems. So I found that uh, it really impacted the way I thought about what my patients were telling me um, in a way that was much richer and I did not fully appreciate with quote unquote, just my master's degree. Um, the systems perspective has really helped me to help my patients navigate the systems they exist in, in addition to helping me navigate the systems I'm wanting to impact as far as academia and then the larger um, national perspectives and systems as well. Thank you so much for those insightful answers. That was great. Um, so my final question to everybody, uh, since we have a mix of DMPs and PhDs, how can we harness this power of, of advanced practice nursing and form collaborations between DNPs and PhDs? Anybody want to go first? <laughs> That's a top, I, I will go first because that's uh, something that I actually have multiple conversations with different people and different leaderships here at The Ohio State uh, and also used to at Michigan. And honestly, I think we, I think in a way, I think this like trying to discern the differences between the degrees should be less focused and like even at the education level, even during the school, I know like a lot of DMP students are very busy because most of them do work full time and the PhD program has certain requirements that we have to meet. So there's this like workload issue, but I think honestly, at least one project should be together because especially for me uh, doing a research around nurses and nurses well-being and workforce and things like that, I cannot do it without you know, the support of the CNOs and nurse leadership and the directors of uh, nursing research. So like everything I do requires, you know, collaboration from people that are like on the ground. And to be honest, like my work is meaningless if my work cannot be translated into different institutions. So I really personally and professionally firmly believe that my role as a researcher is really the generating the knowledge and DMP, you know, I can't do what they do and they can't do what I do to a certain degree, but what we, we do have a lot of an overlapping um, of the translation of the research and also from practice, there's a lot of wisdom that comes out of the practice and it informs the research. So it is, I don't see it as, um, two silos, but traditionally, I think just the logistical reasons and the bandwidth of each profession having or each degree having that kind of made us stay in our, our silos. And um, but I really do think that maybe we could start at the education level, too. And then for, you know, at where I am at Ohio State, we are trying to do a lot of collaboration. So for my Grants that I write, I try to have a DMP person who I could collaborate with so that things like that. But there's definitely more power together than alone. I love what Jin just said um, about PhDs and DNPs needing to be at the same table, to be talking, to be forming relationships because it is this reciprocal and mutually reinforcing process that is you know, advancing healthcare and working with these systems. And I think first it's about finding mutual interests and passions between PhDs and DNPs and really working together to examine those systems and to look at the clinical problem together, especially when we're considering 
innovation in healthcare, many times there, there is a lack of knowledge, a lack of data um, that's needed to address some of these problems. And I see that as being a role for the PhD to construct and develop the research and then to gather the data and disseminate the research um, that then the DNP can run with and pull into the practice setting. So I think it's essential to have these conversations and to collaborate, especially when we're thinking about this rapidly changing face of healthcare, which seems also relevant right now in the context of COVID. I agree with what Danielle was just saying. I think that, um, you know, we, as DNPs, we can really, um, we can really apply what has been learned from what we learned from the PhD research and we can really run with it. But also we can think of, of research projects that we could work on with PhDs and we can collect data. We, we see where the problems are too and we can really work together to finish those projects. And I think I would just echo Jin's sentiments around, you know, there's really um, the potential, a lot of opportunity between a lot of our academic and kind of clinical partnerships that we kind of already have in place, but looking at those opportunities to tease out chances or, or placements for collaboration uh, between the two, um, especially with the different research and teaching institutions and um, the fact that we often are in many of the same circles, but don't necessarily realize that we are in terms of the problems that we're both looking at from different lenses. So uh, I definitely think that there, there are opportunities there for collaboration and just kind of mutual understanding too. Having DNPs know what PhDs are doing and, and what's their kind of area of expertise and vice versa as well. That was great discussion. Um, I want to just take a few minutes and turn it over to uh, Dr. Vetter and Dr. Squires to talk specifically about the programs, the PhD and DNP programs at NYU Myers. Um, there's been several questions in the chat, so the, which they have been answering, but I also want to make sure that we address some of these um, to, to everybody in case you've missed the what's going on in the chat about, you know, how long the programs are and stipends and um, New York State requirements, things like this. So I, I, I definitely want to give you two a few a, a little bit of time to talk respectively about your programs so uh dr squires do you want to go first sure so thanks everyone this was a really great discussion and uh i love our our alumni highlighting the best of everything that's nyu uh dphd and dnp and so for the PhD program, basically uh, our students, um, when they come into the program, we guarantee them three years of uh, tuition funding plus a living stipend that's about 30 grand um, over the year. And what we, uh, once you're in the program, and we do have both bachelor's entry and master's entry now for the PhD program, which is great. And once you are in the program, uh, basically your first year is largely focused on methods coursework where you're developing a solid foundation with which to be able to build and develop research and understand your problem of interest. Uh, almost everybody changes their mind when they come into the program <laughs> in terms of what they want to study and that's perfectly normal, it's okay. And uh, then once you start progressing on uh, in your second year, you can take electives anywhere at NYU, uh, whether it's in engineering if you wanna do informatics, in West, Wagner if you wanna do public policy, uh, in the arts and sciences, it doesn't matter. And that it really adds to a very rich experience um, uh, for our students. And then our students usually take anywhere uh, after the two years of coursework, they'll take anywhere from an additional two to three years to finish. Some people end up taking longer, that's usually because life happens. Uh, but once uh, they're through, uh, we our recent statistics show that 55% uh, of our graduates go on and do a postdoctoral fellowship and uh, end up in academia somewhere. And another 45% end up in what I would call a research leadership role, similar to what uh, Melissa is doing uh, with her work. But uh, basically, they're working with health systems or large, uh, large organizations like Partners in Health to uh, do more uh, re research at the organizational level and research that is also involving capacity building within an organization. 
So, and the, the great thing about going through our program is you end up prepared for, for either role uh, when you graduate. And uh, we have, you know, in terms of people working, we know people are going to work, they need to work. You can't spend four years eating ramen noodles um, from a cup uh, on a PhD stipend in New York City. Uh, so, uh, you know, we really, I, I like to say our graduates come out as masters of time management when they, when they are finished with the program, which sets them up for very well for both academic and uh, industry related roles. So if you would like to learn more, I, I would be more than happy to chat with you. And we also have a, a PhD program info session on Thursday of this week. And I will post that link, uh, the sign up link in that chat in the chat. Thank you, Dr. Squires. I'll turn it over to Dr. Vetter to talk more about the DNP program. Thank you. So um, at Myers, the DNP program is a total of two years from the time that you uh, are admitted to the program. Uh, we go continuously, like I wrote in the chat, uh, through fall, spring, and summer, so that by the end of the second summer, if you're on time and you've not really had any delays uh, due to life, um, we have an 85% completion rate at that point in time. Um, our coursework is essentials of DNP as defined by the American Academy of Colleges of Nursing. And that includes things like clinical leadership, population level, uh, data-driven quality improvement at the systems level. And I think you heard a lot of that in Joan and Danielle's comments. Um, Sometimes the DNP project is completed in the employment location of the student, especially now with COVID, that's a more popular approach. But if for those that are looking for uh, opportunities to spread their wings a bit and be exposed to other healthcare systems, we do clinical placements in um, other than where you work, uh, clinical systems as well. So um, I think one of the key differences is that uh, the tuition uh, for the DNP is by and large tuition remission by the employer. Um, for those that do not have tuition remission, uh, there are some grants and scholarships, but certainly not sufficient to support an entire two years of study. And we are working on that. Um, I think that the motivation for, you know, attending the DNP is, is often to stay in clinical practice. But as you hear, many of our PhD colleagues stay in clinical practice. Um, I think that the point of uh, collaboration intra-professionally for whatever your flavor is, whatever you feel more passionate about, either generating new knowledge or integrating that knowledge into practice. Both options are outstanding for the advancement of the profession. And I often do advocate for more collaboration because at the end of the day, we're all nurses and we're all here for improvement of patient outcomes. I mean, that's the lens we use. So uh, I think that you've gotten a lot of information tonight. Certainly there's much more that we can share, but um, I think we're open for more questions now, Janet, right? You're on mute. You. <laughs> Janet, mute. <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure that was a very animated uh, way to communicate with everyone. So anyways, I uh, just was reminding everybody that if they want to ask their questions, just throw them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we do have some time to make sure that you get all the burning questions off of your chest and ask these wonderful uh, experts that we have in front of us about the PhD and DNP degrees and their experience with that. So um, I am going to go on ahead. I, we've got a couple of questions. Some of them we've 
kind of answered this first one I'm going to, to pose to you guys. Um, can you provide real life examples of how your doctorate degree has impacted your careers? So we've talked a little bit about this, but if you want to share anything else about this, um, go right ahead. There was one question that came up in the chat about um, the track to take when you are not uh, in the New York state, right, or other states that really only accept APRN for DNP education. And Allison brought up that uh, the PhD program has a nursing administration track. Certainly many of the CNOs and other executive leaders in organizations have DNP as a terminal degree. I think what it really boils down to is, do you want to do research or do you want to integrate research into practice? Like to me, that's the fundamental. And, and honestly, it's two sides of the same coin because unless practice informs research and research informs practice, then we really are going nowhere. <laughs> We, we have to look at that as uh, our charge, as uh, doctorally prepared nurses, which I think still to this day, maybe 2% of the uh, nursing population in the United States have terminal degrees, either as a DNP or a PhD. Still. So I could answer the question. Um, I could go first, because it's kind of like related to what Dr. Vetter just said. So I think, to be honest, I cannot think of like a, a single example or even a few examples that my doctorate degree like impacted my career because once I started making the trajectory change, you know, seven, eight years ago when I decided to pursue PhD, like my whole life changed in a way because it really it's not doctor of philosophy for nothing because it truly, you do have to think a lot about philosophy and theoretical frameworks and theories. And I am fully aware because I, you know, teach a lot of students, undergrad and graduate level at different schools. And this conversation comes up often. And I think for me, to be honest, like being a PhD prepared researcher just is who I am now. And obviously being a nurse first, because I am a nurse researcher, I always identify myself as a nurse researcher. And like Dr. Vetter said, many of my research is informed by my past experience as a clinician. And it's not just my experience, but my colleagues. And that's really how I have become like the person I am today. And I was, this question was really interesting because I was just trying to think of an example, but I think for me, it's, it really, I think I am, um, it just impacted my whole life. The way I think and the way I speak and the way I write. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, another question that we've gotten in the chat is the admission process based more on academics, your GPA from nursing degree example or experience um, per se your length of time you've been working as an RN or NP. So I'll, I'll go first on that because um, I, I think it's a little different. You know, the DNP is considered part of the graduate program, right? So we employ uh, a holistic admission process. Uh, we do not have GRE. Um, I review all applications more for the contribution and the uh, passion and the ability of an, uh, a nurse to engage in the DNP program. So. I won't say that GPA isn't important, but it's not the only thing that we look at. We do ask that you write a personal statement and that that personal statement aligns with the DNP essential competencies. So it requires that you have a general understanding of what a DNP education is going to impart to you. Then we ask you to do a, a scholarly writing sample where we just get a sense of at what point you are in your ability to express yourself in a scholarly manner. 
so that we can assist that growth over time. And we often even do interviews, but not always is that required, unless requested by the applicant, then I will always do an interview. But um, our, our uh, post BS to DNP, one thing I wanted to mention is that um, NYU has chosen to retain the master's degree uh, conferral separate where you can get your master's degree and then when you're ready, come back for the postmaster's DNP or you can sign up and do it over a period of five years as well. It takes as long to go from post BS to DNP if you go straight through. Um, the master's admission is, is managed by the program directors of the specialty population foci and we have family, we have um, pediatrics, psychiatric uh, across the lifespan, acute care, nurse midwifery. Um, and so it, it, it's really quite similar for the DNP as you would experience coming into the master's program. So, Allison. So for the PhD program, because we do provide a uh, full scholarship and living stipend, uh, our, we have a, a, a different process that we use. So we have uh, currently, we also no longer require the GRE. We have now waived that, and uh, which is great. Uh, that was an important move and faculty decision on the part of the PhD uh, workgroup faculty. Uh, in terms of GPA, we do have a minimum requirement of a 3.0. And then for the rest of our admissions process, we, we really take a holistic perspective as well. Uh, we, we certainly value applicants who have shown an interest in research previously, either um, uh, through a publication or through working as a research assistant, or um, we have also expanded that definition, however, to include if you've done any type of quality improvement or um, or some, participated in some sort of organizational change project, which we know many uh, frontline staff nurses have done as part of either being in a magnet organization or other types of uh, uh, initiatives uh, uh, init um, brought about by their employer. And uh, in terms of um, successful applicants, we know that um, you, know, you have to take stats when you come in and you have to take two semesters of it. Um, and whether or not you do a quantitative dissertation or not, it's still something that you need to get through in the program. So it really helps if you have taken a graduate level stats course uh, in advance and um, just as preparation for going in for PhD study. And fortunately, we have an exceptionally good um, stats instructor now uh, who has tailored the course to, de to nurses, um, shall we say, concerns and anxieties over doing statistics and complex analyses like that. So uh, that's one of those things that coming into the program, um, when you make your application, we do also require a personal statement and along with your resume. And then um, we, we review all of the applications and then we invite you to an interview day. Um, and this is where you are, uh, uh, you're basically, you're matched up with the people that you identify that you might wanna work with in your personal statement uh, because their research interests align. And uh, it's, a, it's kind of, to, uh, the way I like to think about it is this is a joint interview because you wanna make sure that the person that you're gonna be spending the next four to five years with is a good personality fit for you as and a working style fit for you as it is much a research interest uh, because we really value people who want to do original data collection and original um, research in our program many programs uh, you come in and all you're doing is a secondary analysis of existing data and boom you're done you're out and we really would like to support people who want to do original research uh, like that so um, Basically, so when you're interviewing for the program, you are as much interviewing us as we are interviewing you. 
And then uh, we let people know usually by mid, around uh, mid-February now about whether or not they've been accepted into the program. So then that gives you um, a good solid six months to, to plan your transition into PhD study. And uh, you know we, we work with you along the way to try and facilitate that transition, though it's no matter what happens, your first semester is always a big mind stretch, so. And that, that's really how our uh, admissions processes really work. We really try and take into account what's your, do, do we have a good methods, do we have a good match for you in terms of a faculty mentor, in terms of your areas of interest? And, uh, you know, when we're looking at your interest in the program, what's your whole package? Does this look like you're going to really be a good uh, community member and someone who will thrive in our program? Great, thank you, Dr. Squires. Um, we've gotten a couple more questions in the chat. Um, I know Dr. Vetter wants to address some of these. So uh, the first question was, how long do you have to work on the project? Is it one project and is there any group work? Yes, so this I think is a unique NYU approach um, in that we do, uh, I, I would say like, interface both what you're learning in the classroom and what you're doing on your DNP project. So it's a lockstep process. You come in and in the first course you have in leadership, you're in your clinical placement and you're looking at uh, the organization and assessing it the way, the way you would a patient, you know, so that you understand all of the contributing factors to the theme of improvement that you are going to uh, focus on. And then each course that has clinical hours thereafter for the remainder of the program actually builds the project semester over semester. I think that's one of the reasons we have such a great completion rate is because the coursework is designed to apply the knowledge that you're learning in the classroom, in the project that is building your scholarship for further advancement in the profession. So, was that, was there any other aspect to that question, Janet? Yeah, it was just, uh, how long, how long do you have to work on the project? Is it just oh, it's one, one project, project usually? Okay. Um, you know, we have some COVID accommodations where people have done, uh, you know, uh, kind of like a stratified project, but it always involves designing, implementing and evaluating with data so, you know, when you talk about statistics, we don't have a statistics course per se. You do have to have a master's level statistics course, but we do have an applied epidemiology course where you're looking at um, population level data in order to design effective strategies to improve care at the population level, because we're systems thinkers as DNPs. So I don't know that in either degree you're going to get away from all uh, analytics, you, you know, things like that. So it's one project by and large, and um, it occurs over a period of two years. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is how many students are accepted per class? For the DNP, uh, currently we have 30 students that were accepted this past fall. And for the PhD, uh, it, it depends on the year. Uh, we are graduating uh, quite a number of people this year. So um, we are anticipating taking uh, a class of funded students of probably between seven and 10 people for full-time study. Uh, Part-time study is evaluated separately. Great. So are the undergraduate students able to take half graduate level courses as an elective and ha have the, that count toward a graduate degree? Uh, I can answer that one. So uh, depending, uh, if you're in, currently an NYU undergraduate, there are several master's uh, level courses that you can take that would apply toward a master's degree at NYU. Um, or would potentially could potentially transfer and apply uh, toward your PhD if if 
uh, you ended up doing a PhD with us in the future. Typically though, if you, even if you take a graduate level course at one school and then you go to another place, you, you still often have to repeat it. They don't always transfer uh, graduate credits between schools. And for the DNP program, for the BS to DNP, post BS to DNP, it's an integrated program where the course credits are, um, you, you basically follow the master's curriculum plan for the population focus that you're becoming an APRN, a nurse practitioner in, and then uh, the post master. So it varies according to specialty. So psych would be different from family would be different from ped pediatrics or midwifery. Great. Another question about the PhD program is what's the acceptance rate for this program? Uh, it depends on the year and the number of applicants, but <clears throat> excuse me, over the last few years, it's been averaging about 25% uh, acceptance rate. And uh, generally PhD applications um, tend to be smaller overall. So that's why, you know, 25% acceptance rate is pretty competitive uh, for most PhD programs. Great. And the DNP um, is higher. It, I, you know, it varies from year to year as well as uh, we've grown the DNP program over the last few years. Um, I, I don't have a calculated rate, but I would say it's around 50%. So how much experience is necessary for the BSN to DNP program? Experience as a registered nurse, um, preferably, again, getting back to the area of specialization. So if you are coming into the psychiatric NP program, Danielle, why don't, why don't you take that? Um, if someone were coming in, what type of experience would, would, uh, a registered nurse look to have if they wanted to be a psychiatric NP? Sure. <clears throat> For the Psych NP program, we require one year of psychiatric nursing experience. Now, what's interesting about that is um, many times institutions like hospitals in New York City specifically will not hire an RN to join the psych unit until they have uh, completed at least two years medical surgical nursing. So that could look like three years in nursing practice. However, if you stumbled upon a wonderful opportunity of going right into psych, then one year would be sufficient. And we're really looking for individuals who are very psychologically minded and have done their own self growth work. So it's not just about experience, work experience, but personal development, insight and direction for one's career. So I would say that principle pretty much applies to the BS to DNP across all specialties. So if you're looking to be an acute care NP, then experience in the ICU or the emergency department would be relevant or pediatrics, you know, working with families, with children. Uh, so it's, it's very much uh, decided upon with the program directors of the specialty tracks for the DMP, for the BS to DMP. Great. So this is a question really for everybody uh, on the panel tonight and our faculty members. Um, and it's something that I'm sure is burning on everybody's hearts. Uh, how is the job market looking for those looking to go into academia? And are there enough fellowships for those who want to go that route? Well, I will start off um, being a, a workforce uh, person uh, thankfully or not thankfully, depending on your perspective, we have a national faculty shortage in academia. And we are anticipating that in the next five years, 35% of nursing faculty will be retiring. COVID may also be accelerating uh, many of these retirements because of the, the risks associated with being of a certain age uh, and getting COVID. <coughs> getting COVID. Um, and so in terms of the job market, there, there are plenty of jobs out there and they are in locations all over the country. So you can really have your choice. Um, if you are flexible in terms of 
whether or not you do a postdoc or not, uh, that will also dictate where your jobs are. Um, most of the top research universities in the country do expect you to do a postdoctoral fellowship or have equivalent experience, like kind of what Melissa's doing is sort of the equivalent of doing a postdoctoral fellowship experience. And, uh, you know, it's a non-traditional route, but it's something that a search committee would look at and say, yes, that, that's an equivalent experience. So yeah, plenty of jobs out there, not a problem for whether you're a DNP or a PhD. I would agree. I, and many of our graduates, as you see, go on to teach um, at NYU and at other schools um, and often uh, do maintain their own clinical practice as well because we all, including myself, need to uh, become recertified over time. Uh, so um, that I would say there's plenty of jobs in academia and then just to comment on, uh, you know, the ability to uh, progress or be highly competitive for a job in the practice setting with a terminal degree, I think there is increasing recognition, if you heard that from Joan and others, of the value, the differential value that the DNP prepared nurse brings to the practice setting. You know, that's why the DNP was created for complex healthcare system improvement, practice innovation, and other such things. So um, with a doctoral degree of either type, you are extremely sought after even in practice settings. If I could just Wait. add something to the conversation about um, academic positions. So I, um, once I finished my doctoral degree, I actually moved out to the West Coast to Washington State. And so I, I, would, I would say to those of you who are thinking about academic positions as kind of your longer term goal, um, to just think about um, getting your foot in the door first. Um, uh, depending on where you are, it may not necessarily be as easy to get a full-time faculty position or uh, things of that sort. So I guess one of the things that I kind of learned along the process is maybe just getting a taste for things, getting your foot in the door as an adjunct faculty um, you know, either when you're close to getting out or thinking about that. And that's kind of one way to find out if, A, if, if the institution is a good match for you, but then also to start networking and making those relationships and kind of seeing um, if this is where you want to go and see. Um, I was able to, when I made that move, um, find adjunct faculty appointments very easily. Um, they saw a PhD, they clamored onto you quickly um, to, you know, to work and to, to get opportunities. But making that bridge from an adjunct faculty member to now a full-time faculty member was a little bit more of a challenge. Um, and so you will notice that you may meet a lot of adjunct faculty members who teach at three or four different places uh, because those opportunities for full-time faculty positions, although are very much needed, um, are determined really by funding at institutions. So I would say just to be mindful of that um, in, in when you're thinking about your trajectory and kind of thinking about longer term kind of life, how that works and finances and balancing all of that, um, kind of getting your feet wet a little bit first um, before you make that huge dive um, and transition maybe out of one dependent stream of income to something that may not necessarily be as um, uh, cemented yet. So that would just be the one, the one thought caveat I would add to that. Yeah, and Melissa raises a good point. There are a couple of markets uh, nationally that are kind of saturated with nursing PhDs. Seattle is one of them, um, and San Francisco is another. New York is less so, but what we run into in New York, um, I worked for, I was on uh, the search committee at NYU for six years. What we run into in New York are people who, who just never want to leave. And we understand that, but there are only so many jobs that are available. And so um, you do have to have a certain amount of flexibility in terms of what you think you might wanna do, especially if you are geographically bound. 
Um, and, you know, but if you move to another part of the country where there's a known shortage of nurses and there's different resources for your educational institutions, that could change everything. Um, Melissa is now in Texas and they happen to have quite a number of positions <laughs> open in, in, across Texas. And so it's really, you know, if you are flexible and Jen going to Ohio, you know, Jen was a New Yorker Philly girl for a long time. And uh, then she, she moved to the Midwest and it's, you know, all fallen into place. So if you are flexible and willing to move, that really opens up your opportunities. Of course, not everybody can do that, but you know, I will tell you benefits of working in academia um, are really nice and uh, you know, th they are often worth that kind of change. I also wanted to piggyback off of what Melissa said about exploring adjunct opportunities. Uh, another question to ask yourself, I mean, adjunct opportunity gives you a sense of what you're wanting your future career to look like as well, but if you desire to work in um, master's or doctoral level education, oftentimes institutions require you have a doctorate in order to be eligible for those opportunities when we're talking about full-time faculty. Many adjunct opportunities are available to master's prepared nurses. Um, so a few of my colleagues were working as adjuncts as they were working on their doctoral degrees. However, if, you're, if you know you want to work in undergraduate nursing, the requirements may be different. You may not need a doctoral degree. So that's something to keep in mind, too, when you're kind of exploring your trajectory. Yeah, and in our PhD program, uh, we have you complete a teaching residency where you uh, you can teach either at the undergraduate or graduate level for two semesters. Once you've completed that teaching residency, then you are free as your schedule allows to, um, to work in additional either teaching assistant roles, clinical instructor roles, teach in the sim lab, or uh, even later on in uh, your program, uh, possibly even lead a, a classroom-based course. So we're doing a lot more to prepare graduates for teaching roles um, moving at, when they move out uh, into the academic world. Great, thank you. Another question that's come in is how many students are accepted per class in these programs? So I think we may have answered that. Um, so yeah, I'm um, just to, to say again for the DNP, we have right now a enrollment cap of 30 once a year in, in the fall. Yeah, and uh, PhD program will accept seven to 10 full time students and uh, part time students, uh, depending on the number of part time applicants accepted depends on, uh, well, one, how many applicants we get and, the, and if they their qualifications, um, you know, meet our program standards. Both part-time and full-time applicants are evaluated under the same criteria. Great, thank you. There was one question I noted that it was not answered about whether DNPs can do group projects and the answer is yes. We do both individual projects and group projects and it really is dependent on the scope of the work that needs to be completed. So a group would be expected to do um, work that uh, demonstrates competencies for each student. So typically a group project would have broader uh, implications at the system level. And sometimes an individual project could as well, but we've learned that um, people have very strong uh, preferences for whether or not they work in a group or they work as an individual on their um, project. So we're very flexible and we work to meet your needs accordingly. Yeah, and whereas a dissertation is uh, you are designing and implementing your your research study, and uh, so that is that is that is a key difference, at least at, at uh, NYU. Great, thank you. Uh, we don't have any more questions at this time, um, but wanted to just see if there's anything else that uh, the alumna or our program directors wanted to share before we sign off. 
Can I just add one thing? Like um, this conversation tonight and just listening to the program directors and other panelists from DMP and PhD, I guess I'm just reminded me, like it just reminded me how, how blessed we were at NYU, honestly, like when you're in it, sometimes like life is so hectic or at least it feels like it's so hectic. So you can't see above and beyond, but now I am, you know, I have, slightly grown up a little bit and have a real paying job for the first time in five years since the beginning of my PhD program. Having done, uh, completed a extremely competitive postdoc program at Michigan and now at the Ohio State, which are both extremely uh, research intensive, I, I just wanted to add just my two cents how grateful I am for the PhD program and like all the amounts of knowledge that I gained through our mentors and like really developing my own dissertation research program. And I don't think I fully uh, appreciated the scope and the depth of the support and the learning that I had at NYU. So I just wanted to say thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Jen. Well, uh, before we end our program, I do just want to just give a very huge thank you to all of our alums and our program directors for being here tonight. Uh, this was extremely helpful. Uh, we had a lot of questions, a lot of things going on in the chat. So clearly there's a lot of people really interested in thinking about uh, their terminal degree and what their next career move is going to be. So thank you for sharing your experience and your insights with us tonight. It was extremely helpful. Um, this was also being recorded. So if you wanted to go back and listen to it again, it'll be posted on our website later on this week. So if you want more information about these programs, uh, we'll be following up with some more information, but you can also just get more information by sending a general email to nursing.admissions at nyu.edu. Again, that email is nursing.admissions at nyu.edu and one of our admission staff can get back to you and help answer very specific questions that you may have about either of these programs. So uh, we hope that you do uh, come back to us with uh, and we'll be happy to help you with more information. So um, our next virtual event will be Alumni and Parents Weekend, which is October 22nd through 25th. We have a lot of great programs that weekend. I hope that you tune in. Uh, we have a town hall with our Dean. We have our Professor Chris Kovner, who will be talking about her research about the toll the pandemic has been taking on our nurses, uh, which is very exciting and very interesting, actually. And um, we have uh, other alumni who are speaking at various and sundry events throughout the weekend. So I do hope that you tune in for that. Um, it's completely free this year because it's virtual, which is super exciting. So again, thank you for everyone who's tuned in tonight and uh, we hope to see you online again soon. Good night. Good night. <laughs>